Friday, August 27th, 2021, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to look at how the Bank of England specifically is in denial about the fact that it's basically financing the government through debt monetization. Yes, they do it indirectly through the gilt market, uh, through uh, the market makers. But uh, for all intents and purposes, that's what they're doing. That's what the Federal Reserve is doing as well. That's what the ECB is doing. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the Bank of England because there has been a report uh, actually from the upper house of the British Parliament. Uh, it's the Lord's Select Committee on Economic Affairs. And they started looking at quantitative easing uh, uh, back in January of this year. And they published a report in the middle of July uh, this year, 16th of July. Lynette Zeng covered this. I'm not going to cover the whole report. I'm going to put a link to it, though, uh, below in the description if you want to go through the report. I've gone through the whole report, but I found the part about quantitative easing since the uh, crisis started last year very enlightening. <laughs> uh, they are in denial. There is an old saying, of course, about the duck, and it, it goes like this. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. So that's what's going on. Even uh, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee is questioning that. Investors are questioning that. But you will see uh, the answers from the Bank of England uh, governor and some other people trying to justify that uh, just by communicating uh, to the public and investors that this isn't a duck, <laughs> uh, that everything will be fine. Uh, I think this is really the slippery slope to Weimar um, hyperinflation. And uh, unless they stop this uh, madness, and if they do stop it, of course, we will have a lot of trouble in the housing market. We will see interest rates rise. So I don't think they, they have a choice, but uh, they're going to keep trying to deny that it's a duck or debt monetization for as long as possible. So who is in this uh, House of Lords uh, committee, Economic Affairs Committee? Well, there's 13 members, uh, one that comes uh, to mind here is uh, the Lord King of Lothbury. <laughs> you might think, wow, the guy is a lord and a king. Well, he's Mervyn King, really. He, he was the Bank of England governor uh, from 2003 to 2013. So he was at the helm during the uh, great financial crisis of 08. He started a QE back in 2009 to 2012. Yes, he did stop the QE then. But uh, I remember very well that uh, at one point we had CPI uh, running over 5%. And he never raised rates. He kept them at half a percent. So <laughs> we have him now, of course, out of the Bank of England uh, questioning this. And I would say he's probably one of the big pushers of this uh, report on quantitative easing. Uh, I'm speculating, of course, there's 12 other members. And it's interesting that the report uh, is called Quantitative Easing, a Dangerous Addiction? Question <laughs> mark. Uh, I think it's definitely a dan dangerous addiction. I actually sent an email to Lord King of Lothbury. <laughs> Uh, and uh, recommended that he read Fiat Money, Inflation in France by Andrew Dixon White. And I told him in the email, which they replied to me, uh, his secretary or someone replied to me thanking me for it. Uh, I said, read that book and you realize that you, the, the Bank of England will never be able to stop this and eventually the currency will collapse. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, read the book. 
maybe he will, but I don't think there's much he can do about it. So uh, we're going to go to chapter three to show you how uh, they're in denial, the Bank of England, chapter three of this House of Lords report. So it says QE and the COVID-19 pandemic, independence and accountability. So the Bank of England is supposed to be independent from the government. But uh, with what's happened in the last 18 months, uh, the Bank of England has basically been uh, financing the government, financing huge deficits. Of course, uh, the Bank of England is uh, saying it's not doing that, that it's still independent. But let's go through it. It says the uh, pandemic caused an economic shock that was unprecedented in peacetime. Yes, we can argue about that, but let's keep going. Uh, between April and June 2020, when many businesses were closed as part of a UK-wide lockdown, GDP contracted by 19.5%. In response, the Bank of England cut interest rates to 0.1% and announced several rounds of quantitative easing. We heard that the rapid enlargement of quantitative easing program and the Bank of England's growing role and influence in the economy had reopened debates over whether the policy had compromised the bank's operational independence and whether adequate accountability mechanisms are in place. Commensurate with the expanded mandates of the bank. So here we go. At least they're questioning this. Maybe they're trying to cover themselves, the House of Lords. Uh, because I don't think it's going to end well. Allegations of deficit spending. In 2020, the Bank of England conducted three rounds of quantitative easing, which raised the total amount of government debt uh, owned by the bank from $425 billion to $875 billion, an increase of $450 billion. Minutes published by the Monetary Policy Committee set out the Bank of England's explanations for each round of quantitative easing since March 2020. So let's see how they justify this uh, debt monetization, uh, in my opinion. They say in March 2020, 200 billion of gilts were bought to help improve the functioning, functioning of the gilt market and help to counteract a tightening of monetary and financial conditions that would put at risk the Monetary Policy Committee's statutory uh, objectives. So <laughs> what do they mean by the functioning of the guilt markets and counteracting tightness of monetary and financial conditions? Well, they mean that um, they're there to help the government because uh, investors were going to lose faith and confidence in the gilt market. And how do they do that? Well, by selling gilts. And, and what happens when people sell gilts? Well, the price of gilts drop. When there's more potential sellers than buyers, the price drops and yields go up. The cost of financing goes up for the government. So the Bank of England says, oh, they're not helping the government. They're just helping maintain their uh, statutory uh, objectives. <laughs> well, I I'm sorry, that is a duck. They're helping the government. Uh, but uh, what they're doing here is they're saying, we might be helping the government, but we're doing this as well. So let's keep going. Uh, in June 2020, the Monetary Policy Committee voted to purchase an additional 100 billion of gilts. This was warranted to meet uh, the Bank of England's statutory objectives. So they're hiding behind this statutory objectives, which in my opinion is, is bogus. Uh, they seem to, to think that they need to keep uh, devaluing the currency by 2% every year. <laughs> Why would they do that? Well, that's their uh, inflation objective. And why do I say it's bogus? Because, well, because a central bank worth its salt, <laughs> uh, and, and of course, I don't agree with the institution of central banking, but if you're going to have a central bank and it functions properly and it maintains the integrity of the currency, 
you'd want 0% inflation. And you might say, oh, that's crazy. You can't have that. The economy can't grow. Well, the Bank of England maintained 0% inflation from 1821 uh, to 1914. And you can see here from their own inflation calculator, the Bank of England inflation calculator, there's actually a small uh, drop in, in the CPI during almost those 100 years. Was the UK economy in the doldrums during that period? No. Britain had the world reserve currency and Britain was the biggest empire in the world at the time. So bad excuse. In November 2020, the Monetary Policy Committee voted to purchase an additional 150 billion of gilts to this time it was to support the economy and help to ensure that the unavoidable near-term slowdown in activity was not amplified by a tightening in monetary conditions that could slow the return of inflation to the target. So there you go, uh, justifying <laughs> inflation for, that, uh, for doing that monetization. That's really perverse, in my opinion. And um, yeah, it's that 2%. So yes, there's been a, a lot of people uh, that are not part of the Bank of England uh, that they've used here as witnesses about this, there has been a, a lot of questioning uh, from uh, publications like the FT about this. And uh, they're giving uh, the Bank of England the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they're saying that uh, the Bank of England needs to have more clarity uh, of communication, <laughs> uh, basically more propaganda to make sure that people don't realize that they're actually doing debt monetization. And we even have someone from BlackRock, which seems to be getting involved a lot in uh, central banking uh, policy, uh, not only at, at the Fed in the US, but also at the Bank of England. So the House of Lords uh, committee even asked Rupert Harrison, portfolio manager and chief macro strategist at BlackRock, and this is what he said about the Bank of England. He says, independence of the external members of the Monetary Policy Committee was a protection against the bank acting beyond its mandate. He said, and I quote, this is Rupert Harrison, I am absolutely confident that decisions uh, of the bank are made by the bank in the context of its inflation remit. So there you go, uh, BlackRock justifying uh, that monetization. Uh, and I'm not surprised because uh, as uh, John Titus said, they're running a central bank policy around the world. Uh, they're telling the central banks to keep printing and going direct even. Watch my video with him again. Uh, I'll put a link uh, below in the description, uh, up in the cards. So. Who are these external members of the MPC or Monetary Policy Committee? Well, I had a look at these external members. I think there's eight or nine members of the MPC and four of them are external. It means that uh, they don't work full time at the Bank of England. And uh, two of them are academics. One is called Jonathan Haskell. Uh, he works for uh, Imperial College London, okay? So that, uh, that might uh, raise some alarm bells, right? Uh, the other one is uh, someone called Sylvana, what's her surname? Tenreiro. Uh, she used to work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, so a central banker. The other two guys, uh, are the interesting guys. One of them is Michael Saunders. He worked for Citigroup or Citibank from 1990 to 2016. So I, I don't see him as independent. Of course, he's gonna be asking for QE because uh, his old bosses uh, need the QE, right? He, he's a city uh, guy or a, a city creature. And the other one is even worse. 
Uh, his name is Dr. Gert-Jan Vlieger. He's British Belgium. Uh, well, guess who he worked for? Well, he worked for the biggest hedge fund uh, in London called Brevin Howard <laughs> uh, for two years. And he also worked for Deutsche Bank. So are these guys at the MPC really uh, going to be independent? <laughs> are they going to stop the Bank of England from printing money to keep the financial markets from imploding? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, if they really wanted to have some independent members at the MPC, they'd have someone outside of finance, <laughs> uh, someone uh, who understands economics and what is going on, but they don't. So there you go. Um, yeah, at least I guess the House of Lords is looking into this, asking the question. It, it will be uh, interesting to see whether the Bank of England uh, gets a, a bit of a hint from, from this report. But I don't think so. I think we're going to continue to see money printing. <laughs> and uh, perversely, they're going to justify that because they're going to need to keep uh, inflation at least at 2%. And uh, it's ironic, though, because Mervyn King, when he was as I said earlier, governor of the Bank of England and did loads of QE, we, we saw uh, inflation or RPI or CPI go above 5% before his term ended in 2013. And he never raised rates for that. So um, I think personally, this is just good cop, bad cop <laughs> by the House of Lords uh, Economic Committee. And uh, yes, uh, there's only way, one way to protect yourself uh, against discontinuing inflation. That could turn into hyperinflation. And that's uh, by holding as little uh, of the fiat currency or the Bank of England note as possible. Yes, and gold and silver are, are part of the strategy of staying outside this and protecting your purchasing power. Having hard assets or even property or real estate will help as well. What about uh, taking on a debt or a mortgage uh, to finance purchases of real assets? Uh, that has worked in the past, but you, you have to make sure that um, the um, inflation or even hyperinflation that I see coming does not affect your uh, capacity to service that debt because it could mean that uh, you could uh, default on those debts. So yeah, you need to be careful. Yes, inflation does eat away uh, the value uh, of the debt, but if it gets out of hand, uh, it's another story. So with that, let's quickly look at where the markets are this morning. Today, of course, we have uh, the uh, speech by uh, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I think it comes out at uh, 10, 10 a.m. Eastern Time or 3 p.m. London Time. So uh, the markets, of course, are going to be waiting for that. Uh, right now, it's 8.40 a.m. London. We've got spot gold at 1,800 spot 70. It's up about $9. The high has been 18.05 and the low 17.91. So gold is up half a percent. Silver is up just over half a percent. At 23.68, it's up 13 cents. The Dow future is up 113. NASDAQ future is up 55. S&P future is up 15. Uh, FTSE is up four points. Uh, to the currencies, uh, sterling is up an eighth of a percent at 137.16. The euro is up slightly at 117.59. Uh, the dollar is unchanged versus the yen at 110.07. Dollars down slightly versus the U1 at 647.88. Aussie dollar is up 0.2 of a percent at 72.50. Uh, the dollar is down 0.2 versus the Canadian dollar at 126.62. And the Kiwi dollar is uh, unchanged virtually at 69. 
50. Uh, the commodities now, WTI crude is up 2% actually at almost 69. We're at 68.60, uh, almost a, a dollar and a half higher. High grade copper is up slightly at 425.65. To finish off, the 10 year yield is pretty steady. It's unchanged, just under 1.35%. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great day and a great weekend. Take care. Bye.